everyone and welcome or welcome back to Brainless Pages. Today we're talking about History by John Burnside. I'm very excited to talk about this film. It's another work on the edXL A-level English literature curriculum. Without much further ado, let's dive into the summary and then the stanza by stanza analysis. The film is written in three words and has a very fractured appearance, reflecting how the world shattered for many Americans after 9-11. It also has the appearance of a shore. If you turn it sideways, it looks like waves lapping at a beach, reflecting, of course, the setting and where, where it takes place. At the beach, the tides change no matter what happens. No matter the weather, no matter the time, something is always eternal and constant, and that's the lapping of the waves upon the shore. And I think it's a comment on wider history in general and how we can look at it by only considering the small events, how 9-11 is just a small part in what happened, but it had such a massive impact on not only the individual, but society in general. The beauty of the scene at the beach with the naive, innocent child serves as a reminder that there is still good innocence and love in the world. And there's a key theme of liminality here in transgression. And of course, the beach serves as the border between the sand, the earth, the land, and the sea, the ocean, the limitless expansion of water. In the poem, the speaker and his family are visiting a beach, but while the child plays innocently enjoying his life, the speaker and his partner reflect on the dire state of the world today. There is very little end stopping, giving a stream of consciousness feel to the whole thing. It also reflects the never-ending passage of time, and the shore in this poem could be compared to To My Nine-Year-Old Self, The Gun, A Minor Role, and The Lamas Harling, and Giuseppe, among others. St. Andrews, West Sands, September 2001. Today, as we flew the kites, the sand spinning off in ribbons along the beach, and that gasoline smell from loikers gusting across the golf links, the tide far out and quail gray in the distance, people jogging or stopping to watch as the warplanes cambered and turned in the morning light. The first part of this poem is filled with fleeting moments of tides, of people, Planes. It's almost like the entire world has been fragmented and condensed into these very powerful lines. It's similar to the way that newspapers would condense the events to just the key headlines. This many people killed. These many lives fractured. The building destroyed into so many pieces. The speaker we assume to be the poet because he's reflecting on his personal day out with his family, but occasionally the eye turns to we, and this reflects the shared nature of humanity and how this is a shared experience because the whole world grieved after 9-11. The poem's date is instantly recognizable because of this. It puts us into the moment. It sets the scene. The poem is written with alternating past and present and alternating iambic pentameters and tetrameters interspersed throughout the verse. Today, as we flew, starting the poem was today and then continuing on with the action reminds us that while their reality in the moment is currently unchanged, the whole world was different after. It could never really go back to the state of affairs that, that were there before. It's almost like no matter what they do, the tragedy is always in the background because as we flew. So no matter the kites that they're like flying, no matter what they're doing, it's as we flew. It's simultaneous to the moment that their world shattered into pieces. As we flew the kites, everything seems to happen all at once, and no matter how much the speaker tries to focus on the sand and the images of the kites as the ultimate childhood experience, even the sand is spinning off in ribbons. Of course, there are ribbons because the wind is making patterns of, on the beach, but the speaker can't help, bearing the news in mind, to feel like spinning in Spinning the pieces on the land is much like how the pieces of the building would have fractured and been spinning around in the air when the planes hit the towers. No matter how much he looks at the tide far out and people jogging, the events are still in back of his mind. Around him, there's this mundanity that feels incredibly odd. Perhaps these people are unaware of the news, or perhaps they're unconcerned. But the speaker just can't let it go. The imagery of ribbons is also a beautiful one visually. We can't help but imagine the sand making similar waves on the shore, just like the actual sea waves. It shows that both the land and the ocean can experience the impact. It's a universal experience, much like how 9-11 wasn't just experienced by America, but had consequences for the rest of the world. Loikers was an airbase nearby the beach, from which the gasoline smell was gusting across. Now, that smell is particularly noticeable because of the events in America, whereas on another day, it would have just been something in the air. Now it's something that 
he can't escape. It's a part of his senses that overtakes and overshadows the entire experience. It's an allegory for how everyone was affected. Everyone could suddenly smell this gasoline. Everyone's attention was drawn to it, drawn to how fragile human experience really was. It even gusted over the golf links. Golf is a traditional like leisure and recreational sport. When people go to play golf, they don't think about anything. They only think about the hole and the golf hole. It's a chance to relax really, but now even that smell was gusting over the gulf. People could no longer relax, people could no longer live in peace, bearing in mind the recent tragedy. Yes, this film is about the beach and gulf, but through all this simple and beautiful language, we can see meticulously drawn parallels because he uses the mundane to represent the universal. It's a sensory description. It involves our senses, what we can see, what we can touch, what we can hear. The tide is described as quail gray. So a quail is a small bird. The tide is unreachable. The weather is not very sunny. The sky is not a bright color, neither is the ocean. Everything blurs into one as the borders of everything the world has known also become blurred by the events. People are jogging. I mean, if we take it quite literally, they're running away from the problem, trying to distract themselves, focusing on life, focusing on the future ahead. They're unwilling to pause and reflect because pausing and reflecting means acknowledging the tragedy. Others stop to watch. Others consider. They think about what's to come, just like the speaker. The planes circle. After 9-11, most air bases increased activity, which of course also further drew up the concern because in the morning light highlights that this is just the beginning. It's emphasized in this next bit. Today, with the news in my mind and the muffled dread of what may come, I knelt down in the sand with Lucas gathering shells and pebbles, finding evidence of life in all this driftwork, snail shells, threads of razorfish, smudges of weed and flesh on tide-worn stone. The muffled dread refers to the fear, very justified fear that people felt after the events. I mean, considering all the things that went on afterwards, it wasn't an unreasonable fear to think that perhaps America was getting way too involved in something people would have rather stayed out of. People thought things would get worse. They would escalate, as they in fact did with later events of Iraq and really countless others, the worsening relationships towards the Muslim world. The speaker gathers shells, pebbles, finds evidence of life in the driftwork. Evidence of life, I mean, it's ironic because it's more like evidence of death since fossils are long buried creatures. Everything, even these beautiful objects on the beach, remind him of the death and of the tragedy experience. In a way, the hunt for and the desperation to find something is also alluding to the desperation that people felt in America, trying to find survivors, trying to find their loved ones among the people who were not in the rubble. Drift work. This is referencing things that drift, things that are carried forward by the tide, swept away, just like people's emotions, people's lives are swept away in a single moment. Snails, shells, shreds, this repetition of sibilance, there's a soft whisperance. We can almost hear the rustling of the river, the susurration of the water on the sand, smudges of weed and flesh. I mean, it's not a pleasant image. It feels wrong. Like these decomposing remains can never be full again. The poem seems melancholy in the way that it's grieving all these objects, almost acknowledging that they can never be full again. Just like I assume many people felt that America would never be full again. At times, I think what makes us who we are is neither kinship nor our given states, but something lost between the world we own and what we dream about behind the names. It's very separate from the rest of the world as it shifts the focus from the outer natural world into the inner world of the speaker. It's our first understanding of a direct comment on the news by the speaker because previously he has been passively re referring to the event, perhaps in the denial stage, not really wanting to acknowledge that it's happening. This is a step closer. He begins to reflect on our on our humanity, on neither kinship nor our given states. He's saying that what makes us human is not our blood. Our identity is only partly formed by nationality, religion, belief. Instead, he's saying that it's something we can't name, the gap between our desires and reality, between what we want, between what we can't have. It's our wishes, desires, the way that we react to them that drive us. It's also us by nature of being human. So all of these events is just a human expression of something they wanted and the lengths to which they went to get it. On days like this, our lines raised in the wind, our bodies fixed and anchored to the shore. It's almost like it's the kites I've mentioned previously, the symbol of childhood, that's keeping him tethered, not the other way around. So it's almost as if he's going to float up into the air. And by having kites, a symbol of childhood experience, it's almost like the only thing keeping 
people with faith in the world is their small childhood self. The small childhood self that grew up in the world not knowing of how evil people were and how sometimes people hurt each other, but the child that appreciated the natural world. It's also a symbol for how unsure he is of where he is, of where he may go, of where he wants to go. His mind is going to all these different places, but his body is fixed, so it's almost like his mind is the kite that's soaring and flying up ahead. And though we are confined by property that tether us to gravity and light, has most to do with distance and the shapes we find in water. Reading from the book of silt and tides, the rose or petrol blue. Although we're further constrained by our property, our materialism, our actual positions, what really makes us feel the lines, the connections between people, what really makes and breaks our existence is our connection to nature. The book acts as an extended metaphor for nature. This reading from the book of silt and tides, the rose or petrol blue, it's reading from the book, i.e. examining nature and thus ourselves, we may begin to see that very silt and tide and the rose and really by examining history we may begin to understand humanity and thus ourself. Of jellyfish and sea anemone combining with a child's first nakedness, Suddenly, in this book of life, everything blends into one, from the jellyfish to the anemone to human flesh. The jellyfish, the sea anemone, they have, sim they have similar colors, showing us that there are more connections than we think and more links between us and the natural world. We all come from the same thing, we all have a right to exist in this world of gravity and light, and we can only truly begin to understand existence and humanity when we begin to understand and respect nature. Sometimes I'm dizzy with the fear of losing everything, the sea, the sky, all living creatures, forests, estuaries. We trade so much to know the virtual, we scarcely register the drifts and tug of other bodies. Here the poet expresses his true vulnerability. It's not darkness, it's not spiders, it's not agoraphobia, it's the fear of losing everything. And just on a personal note, sometimes I think we truly grow up only when we stop fearing the tangible and begin to fear the universal and intangible, like dying alone or always being alone. We know we're one day destined to experience this sadly, and that's terrifying. The loss of everything, of all that we have loved, the sea, the sky, this asyndetic list is a list without many concerns, but a list without many connectors, but it seems to cover it all. Rather than the specific, it seems to be still unopened, unfinished. As we grow and love, we begin to fear losing much more. We trade so much to know the virtual. As we plunge into the virtual world and never-ending entertainment gadgets offer us, we begin to pursue a more solitary experience, scarcely registering humanity and our connections as before. These lines build nostalgia. They prompt us to think back to childhood, the past in general. Consider when we were children and the world was not connected and life was easier, less sad, calmer, scarcely apprehend the moment as it happens, shifts of light and weather and the quiet local forms of history, the fish lodged in the tide beyond the sands, the long insomnia of ornamental carp in public parks, captive and hung in their own slow burning transitive gold jam jars of spawn and sticklebacks or goldfish carried home from fairgrounds to the hum of radio. But this is the problem, how to be alive in all this gazed upon and cherished world and do no harm a toddler on a beach, sifting wood and dried weed from the sand and puzzled by the pattern on a shell, his parents on the dune slacks with a kite plugged into the sky on nerve and line. We're so much within the digital world that we find out these news instantly, yet we don't truly understand until we're forced to see the tragedy. Be reminded of our frail existence, reminded to pursue the life we want with the shifts of light and the fish lodged in the tide beyond the sands and the long insomnia of ornamental carp in public parks and the slow burning transitive gold champ jars of spawn. It's almost like we have to be pulled out of our entertainment and our ga gadgets by tragedy. <laughs> How the fish hide in the tide. It's a hidden beauty until we take the time to examine the ocean, something we never do until we're forced to reflect. The carbs in public parks, we put them for our amusement. They're living creatures that we force to hang in their own slow burning transit of gold. Just like the fish and spawn we used to capture, so too we capture these moments and these entertainments instead of focusing on what truly matters. This is the problem, he's saying. We don't know how to live in this gazed upon and cherished world. We don't know how to look upon a world that we don't know how to cherish. The use of the word cherish itself seems ironic. We don't know how to raise our kids to respect the world when we ourselves have not learned to understand it yet, when we ourselves have not learned to respect it. We're unsure of how the, the child can learn about the world without hurting it. How do we send 
kids to go to zoos to look at animals they've never seen before to ensure they know what they look like without hurting those very animals? How do we ensure the kids know and gain responsibility without giving them a live fish and teaching them responsibility? Meanwhile, the child is learning about the world by examining history, by looking at the fossils, by looking at the sand, while the parents are looking into the future, all nerves, all nerve and line plugged into the sky. The language is very playful here. There's a lot of sibilants and there's also a lot of fricative Fs. It's almost as if everything is collapsing here. Stop T sounds, P and F, fricative sounds, L and W, liquid alliteration, toddler on a beach, parents on dune slack, it's contrasted. It's almost like they're very divided, but still very connected, almost like a physical umbilical cord. Just like the speaker argues that there are connections between every single human on this earth. This is appropriate given the previous message of our interconnectedness. Patient, be afraid, but still, through everything, attentive to the irredeemable. The parents are unsure, looking at the sky now, of how they can be, how can they continue to exist. The poem ends his poet with what? The, the poet ends his poem with some advice, to be patient, to be afraid, to be worried about the future by all means, but to not forget to pay attention to the present, which is irredeemable. It's what we can not get back if we live too far in the past to notice what's going on, if we live too far in the future to pay attention to our history. We're losing the present, we're losing our ability to enjoy the moment, and that is irredeemable. History is our present because it's the things that we leave behind the most. Our present, our moments now are not moments that we can ever relive and ever really experience. And with that beautiful message, I hope to end this video today. So thank you so much for watching it and please do stick around. It really means a lot. Let me know your comments. Let me know any thoughts you have in the poem and I will see you soon.